Good morning. Good Chicles, the country church, Marion, Texas. A short drive to worship the Lord in a relaxed atmosphere. <clears throat> well, this morning, we deal with the matter of the threatened prophet. And if I stay in Jeremiah much longer, I'll be that threatened prophet. <laughs> but there's no doubt that the prophet was Jeremiah. And there's little doubt that this took place during the reign of King Jehoiakim. His father, King Josiah, was a godly man, but he himself was not. He wasn't the least bit interested in what Jeremiah had to say about things political, and he didn't have any concern for what he said about things spiritual. The least bit interested. Well, what few realized is the sovereignty of God. And these first 17 verses really deal with the sovereignty of God. And sovereignty is a big word. And you kind of get to where you like the way it rolls off your tongue. Sovereignty. The sovereignty of God. And what it basically means is that God has a right to rule. That he created all of this. And he has a right to rule all of this. It's amazing. Man doesn't always receive that. And they think that they have the right to rule. That they're the captain of their own fate. And they deny the sovereignty of God. Well, I'm told that there's over 30 words in the Hebrew language that relate to pottery. I thought that there were 28 myself, but uh, <laughs> over 30 words in the Bible that relate to the matter of pottery. And <clears throat> sometimes the Lord chooses to reveal things to us in strange ways. Have you noticed that? I mean, sometimes and often it ought to be by prayer that we're praying about something and eventually God will answer us. There's a time that he's silent, but God answers us in prayer. We're always to be in the word of God and to study to show ourselves approved and to realize that God is not going to act or reveal something that's contrary to his word. And so we thank the Lord for that. But then there's other times that uh, he reveals things to us in a different way. And I have said I've learned more from the back end of a cow than I have from the front end of some people. <laughs> but uh, he reveals himself in various ways. And here he does to Jeremiah in the simplest of ways. <clears throat> He's walking past the potter's shop. Now, this isn't a one-time experience. He probably passed that thing every day of his life. But on this particular day, particular time, God spoke to him and gave him a message. And then it really gets interesting. He said, now after you've preached this message, they're going to put you in jail. I'd have kept walking probably, but still. Uh, you can learn a lot by watching and by listening. And Jeremiah watched this potter at his work. We used to have a couple in the church that the man was a potter. And uh, he showed us one time, remember that, and uh, I don't uh, senior luncheon or whatever, what it was to mold and, and uh, to make pottery. And he used various examples from the Word of God. <coughs> but 
Well, there's so many messages here. He saw the clay resist the potter's hand so that the vessel was ruined. Boy, that's a lesson in itself, isn't it? Sometimes we resist the potter's hand, his dealing in our life, and we wind up destroying a good portion of our life just from this resistance to the potter's hand. Well, a nation that refuses to yield to the Lord, our church that refuses to yield to his leadership, are we as individuals who refuse to yield to the Holy Spirit of God? We're in danger there. Well, God doesn't need any advice from us, nor can we criticize what he does. He's sovereign. He doesn't have to explain things to us. You ever have any grandkids or great grandkids? Why? Well, so and so. Well, why? Well, why? 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 And uh, we're not any different than our kids and grandkids. <coughs> Lord, why this? I guess a lot of people don't see humor in the Word of God. I, I guess I do. Maybe it's a sick humor, but nevertheless, it's humor. I, I really like the, the story of Job in the Bible. And Job finally reaches the bottom of the ladder. And he starts asking God questions. Lord, why this? Why this? Why this? And f I, I believe you counted up. I think there's 42 questions. Now, I know that Job was kin to my grandkids. Uh, but uh, 42 questions he asked God. Lord, why hast thou? Lord, why hast thou? And God's silent. He didn't. He just, he just listened. And there's times that God is silent, that he doesn't just jump to our command. He's not a table waiter. And we, a little more tea here, a little more, you know. No, he's, he's patient. And when he, <coughs> when he did speak to Job, and, and he's got all these 42 questions laid out in front of him, he doesn't answer one of them. Not one. And the Lord said, where were you when I hung the stars in space? Where were you when I did all these things? Because he's sovereign and he has a right to rule. So God doesn't need any advice from us. And the scripture continually reminds us of that. Romans eleven thirty four, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Don't lie to me, you have too. Lord, why don't you? Lord, couldn't you do? Lord, why not this? Romans 9.20 says, Nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed, in other words, the clay, say to him that formed it, Why have you made me so? You know. Isaiah 40, verse 13. Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord, and being his counselor, hath taught him. Lord, here's something you might consider. <laughs> or Jeremiah 23, 18. For who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord, and hath perceived and heard his word? Who hath marked his word and heard it? You know, there's a mystery involved in the relationship between divine sovereignty and human responsibility. God has a right to rule, and we have a right to obey. Well, we don't need to explain the will of God before we can obey it. Isn't that what most of us try to do? If I really understood the Word of God, 
And if I ever really understood the will of God, I, I'd do it. You know, guess what? You don't have to know. You don't have to understand, but you do need to be obedient. Well, they didn't want to walk in God's ways, and they were on a deadly detour. I got to get this off my chest. I'm sick and tired of detours. <laughs> I mean, you don't drive anywhere around this place, uh, 50 miles around it, and then get out of town and you pick up another group. Detour. Detour. They were on a deadly detour. But God was willing to mold them again, and he's willing to mold us again. You know, he gave new beginnings to Abraham, to Moses, to David, to Jonah, to Peter, and he'll do the same thing for us. we got to stop and we've got to turn around. I listened to a black preacher the other day and, and uh, he could alliterate like nobody's business and, and he said, y'all have to get yourself a, a, a navvy. Uh, in other words, a navigator in your vehicle. And he said, I, I love my navigator. He said, and I punched in my destination and I was heading down the freeway and my navigator came on and talked to me and said, turn around. You're going in the wrong direction. And I turned around because I was headed the wrong way. He said, the reason was I was listening to my music, and I love my music. And the music distracted me, and I was going the wrong way. He built it all up, and he said, some of y'all been listening to the world's music, and you're going the next direction, the wrong direction, and you got to turn around. I remember that. Don't even remember what I had for breakfast, but uh, it made an impression. Well, I'm thinking of the prodigal son. When he repented, God heard his prayer. How, how many of us want God to hear our prayer without any repentance? You know, Lord, hear, Lord, answer, but I'm not changing. Well, God heard his prayer and he was revived, the prodigal, and restored. And it can be that way with us, but it, it begins with him. He came to himself. He came to the Father. He found love. He found mercy. He found forgiveness. But it started with him. I shouldn't say this, but a lot of us, like my dog, Bix, Bix, Bitsy, she does just throws herself on her back and says, rub my stomach and everything will be all right. It's kind of the way we are. Well, notice the conspiracy of the enemy. In verse 18, it says, Then said they, Come, let us devise devices against Jeremiah. For the law shall not perish from the priest, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet, come and let us smite him with a tongue and let us not give heed to any of his words. Proud sinners don't enjoy hearing about the sovereignty of God. How dare you say that God has a right to do this? God has a right to do that. He has a right to rule. To them, that's offensive. Proud sinners don't ever enjoy hearing about the sovereignty of God and his right to rule. 
And these thought that by silencing the messenger, they'll silence the Lord. No. You know, you can't outrun the Holy Spirit of God. Now, when I'm thinking about y'all and dealing with y'all, that tickles me to death. I don't like it for myself, though. But you cannot outrun the Holy Spirit of God. And so even as a pastor, even with a tough message, you know what I'm thankful for? You cannot outrun the Holy Spirit of God. You can shut me out, but you cannot shut him out. And sometimes his whisper is so loud, it's a shout. And we can't outrun it. So we know that his word never returns empty or void. Like today, if he's dealing with your heart, I know it. He loves you. He wants to draw you unto himself. And I don't sit there, I don't care if you sit there with your hands folded and a stiff lip. He's still, his word's not going to return empty or void. It'll accomplish that for which he sent it forth, the Bible says, and it will prosper thereby. Well, you can run, but you can't hide. Over and over, uh, and I was, I shared with my Sunday school class, we, we do try to hide from the Word of God sometimes, <coughs> from the God of the Word. Dale used to have a mule named Red. And uh, this mule was something you'd go out to catch him and he'd get behind a little old tree, <laughs> little old tree like this. And his ears stuck out like that on both sides. But that mule didn't think you could see him because he was behind that tree. And you could walk around and he'd walk around. You couldn't see him. He was invisible. <laughs> so he thought. But those ears were hanging out on both sides of the tree. Sometimes we're like red. We don't think God can see us. We, as long as we stay behind this tree, God can't see me. Oh, he sees. Sees your ears hanging out. <laughs> Never mind, that's too much. <laughs> over and over, Jeremiah faced this conspiracy that flat threatened his ministry and his life. His enemies wanted to take a smear campaign. They were into politics, yes, and they were... Did anybody get that besides me? <laughs> and they were spreading lies to whoever would listen. And it was just like those who plotted against the Lord Jesus. Jeremiah's enemies tried to prove that he was breaking the law and that he was stirring up the people... In Luke, the 23rd chapter, first seven verses, and the whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ the king. And Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, Thou sayest it. Then said Pilate to the chief priests and to the people, I find no fault in this man. And they were the more fierce, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. And when Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod who himself also was at Jerusalem at the time. Well, faithful servants of God didn't enjoy opposition, but they had come to expect it. 
And I admit that when we've studied and prayed and we've gotten a word from God and we sense that God is moving in our midst, we expect people to move out and receive the word. Don't we? I think of the young preacher that was talking to a wise old man and he said, uh, you know, I preach and I study and I preach and I give out the gospel and I extend the invitation and nobody comes. And the old preacher said, do you expect somebody to come every time you preach the gospel? He said, well, no, I guess not. He said, that's your problem. You don't expect. It ought to be a common thing. The word goes out, the people come in. Anything less is not a blessing to the Lord. Well, John 16, 33, Jesus says, In the world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. He also says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. And he reminds Timothy, he said, yea, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. I've had people say, well, the devil's not bothering me. Could it be that you're going in the same direction? I mean, why would he bother you? He'll go bother somebody that's trying to take a stand for the Lord. Paul said that we be counted worthy to suffer. Well, I'm afraid we're guilty of advocating an easy believism, a weak commitment, and a non-existent discipleship. Paul told the Corinthian church, he said, there's, an, there's a great door and there's an effectual door that's opened unto me and there are many adversaries. You know what we do? We're faced with some opposition and we, well, this surely must not be of God because I'm having opposition. If you don't have any opposition and it's of the Lord, you may not be as in the Lord's will as you think you are. So we're faced with opposition even with an open door. Well, this calling people to an easy believism, a weak commitment, non-existent discipleship. Jesus is worth so much more. You ever stop and think about his journey from heaven to Bethlehem? You know, I, my mind may not always be sanctified, but it's always got an imagination. You know, I think what it must have been like with the angels whispering to each other, saying, have you heard about King Jesus leaving all of this behind? Leaving this behind, what's better than this? You know, well, I heard that he's going down there. He's, he's going to suffer and bleed and die and he's going to overcome death and hell and the grave. Can you believe that? Yeah, but I heard that he's going to do it for people that don't even love him. That don't even care. And he left all the glory and came to a sin-cursed earth for me and for you. Well, he's worthy of so much more. How condescending was that? The king of all glory taking on the role of a servant. One of my favorite 
stories in all the Word of God is that Jesus was washing the disciples' feet. And he came to Peter, and uh, I love old Peter. Peter said, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. I have need to wash your feet. And the Lord said, if I don't wash your feet, Peter, I won't have any fellowship with you. And Peter then, impulsive Peter, said, Lord, then just wash me all over. Because I want to be clean like you. And Jesus said, Peter, you're clean all over, but you need your feet washed. You know, when you're saved, you've been washed in the fountain. As white as snow. And you're like the people in Jerusalem who went to the public baths. And you've got all sudsed up, cleansed up, cleansed up, shampooed up. Conditioned up. I don't know how much more up you can get, but uh, they uh, dried off, put on their robes, their sandals, and walked back home or walked to the neighbors wherever they were going. But as they traveled, they picked up the dust from the streets of Jerusalem. And when they got to where they were going, they had a basin and water and a towel. And their feet were washed. And just, just their feet. Peter said, give me another bath all over. And he said, no, you've been washed. But you've picked up the dirt of the world. And you need to have that cleansed. Some of you have been to the fountain filled with blood. You've been saved. But you've picked up some dirt in the world. And you need to have your spirit your feet spiritually washed. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, you think about his crucifixion and what, what was that like? You know, uh, I am, have a ve very low tolerance to pain and if they gave me, give me pain pills if a little does good then a lot ought to do better I don't like pain you know so you do I mean every, I, okay but Jesus went through the pain of the cross so I didn't have to you think of the burial where he overcame death, hell, and the grave. Isaiah 53, 9 says, And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Mm. And the agony of the prophet, 19 through 23, and this is lament number five to the Lord concerning his situation and his ministry. In Jeremiah 11, 12, 15, 17, chapter 20, the words were really harsh, but Jeremiah was a divinely appointed prophet. He represented God to the nation. And he said, Lord, deliver me and take them out. <laughs> Those who opposed him were opposing him while they were opposing God. And Jeremiah was just asking God to deal with them. Years ago, I had a meeting with some religious people who were scared about the end times. And they had found a track in, in a place that I wouldn't have suspected it uh, in their denomination headquarters. And it was written by an Italian priest. And the track was entitled Seven Days of Darkness. And basically, in a 
rather crude way, it presented the tribulation and everything that would take place, and they were scared to death. And the lady worked for a man who was a born-again believer, and she began to ask him questions, and he said, I can't answer those, but I have a friend that, that can. Let me call him up. And so I met him, and the lady said, it's not just me that has these questions. I've got 11 friends that they're all concerned, and they're all afraid. And so we set an appointment. I was to go to their house, and uh, I had my Bible, and I had some notes. And, and uh, when I got there, this lady, uh, she, she jumped on me like a duck on a June bug. I barely made it inside the door. And she said, you don't believe this, we believe this. You don't believe this, we believe this, and everything. And I'm thinking, Lord, I can't do it with this lady just attacking me. Would you just do something? And the phone rang, and they told the lady, it's for you. Your kids are sick. And I tell you, she, she said, I have to go because my kids are sick. When she walked out of that house, I felt like Judas had left the room, you know. And I didn't pray that God had hit her with a bus or anything, but I sure saw that she was disrupting what God wanted done. She left. We had a chance to share the gospel. And 11 people prayed to accept Christ as their Savior, you know. Uh, so, Deuteronomy 32, 35, Romans 12, 17 through 19, they speak of this same manner, that the prophets weren't afraid to say, Lord, please shut them down, that the gospel will go out in its purity and strength. Uh, I did a funeral for a, really I did it for a family. But the guy in question, the husband, you know, he was a tough booger. And I talked to the family about during the services and things I wanted to express and so on and so forth. And I said, sir, is there anything that you'd like me to add about your wife? He said, make it short. That's the only thing I want to hear, is that you make it short. That touched me. I drug that thing out. Through <laughs> four episodes of Blue Bloods. <laughs> anyway, we left there and we went to the graveside. And uh, we get up there, and he, he walked up to the casket, and he slapped it. He said, that's enough of this. And he walked off and lit a cigarette. And the lady said, Brother Butch, you want me to go get him? And I said, no, ma'am, this part is just for the believer in Christ Jesus, you know. Sometimes you just get enough. Well, like Elijah and the other prophets, Jeremiah was a man of like passions. And he felt deep pain because the leaders were rejecting the truth. And you have to admire the fact that as often as he was attacked, he turned them over to the Lord. Angry? Yes but he turned them over to the Lord. There's a righteous anger against sin that is acceptable to God. Do you know that? Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, And be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Unrighteous anger takes the matter into our own hands and 
seeks to destroy the offender. That's you. No, <laughs> that's me. You know, sometimes we say, Lord, I'll handle this one. You know, that's unrighteous anger. While righteous anger turns the matter over to God and seeks to help the offended. You know, thanks to the media in our day, we're exposed to so much violence and sin that we've come to accept it as a part of life. And we've become hardened to the gospel of Christ. We need to be molded into his image, don't we? We need to surrender ourselves to the Lord and his will like the clay should surrender to the hands of the potter. We've become hardened to the gospel of Christ. You can see us broken a lot of times at the bottom of the wheel, but the Lord will mold us if we allow him and if we not resist the Holy Spirit of God. Sometimes we fight against the Holy Spirit of God. We know we ought to be here. We know there's decisions that we need to make in our life. We know that God wants us to make them. But we push back and we resist when we ought to yield to the Holy Spirit of God. Maybe you're here and you're not saved. You can be saved today. That's a wonderful good news. Right where you're at, you can bow the knees of your heart, agree with God that you're a sinner, that you can't save yourself, and you want him to come into your heart and life and save you. You do, and he will. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then some of you are saved. And you're saved from the top of your head to the bottom of your, your feet. But you've never followed the Lord in baptism as a believer by immersion. Showing that he saved me all over. And I believe in his death and his burial and his resurrection. I'm dead to myself and alive to walk and follow after him. And maybe you're here saved and identified and want to plant your life in the life of this church. If God's speaking to your heart, we want you to know that you're welcome. You're welcome. Let's stand and pray. Father, we do thank you for your word and Lord given us illustrations that, that we can understand that are real to us. We can see it, we can see it, we can see it. And so, Lord, we pray that eyes would be opened all across the auditorium. Hearts would be touched. Conviction would come. And people would make that decision for you. And, Father, we will praise you for it. For we ask you.